Thank you, Marcus well, Simon, for joining us. I'll just let you talk a little bit and um, then we'll move into our program. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Stair. My name is Marcus Simon. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. I represent the 53rd District, which has got the City of Falls Church in Merrifield. Um, and this year I am the Vice Chair of the Privileges and Elections Committee. Uh, so I um, am very involved in uh, you know, voting laws, elections, campaigns. Uh, very excited, as Sarah was talking a little bit earlier, very excited to be in the majority. I, I started um, in the General Assembly in 2014, and we had 67 Republicans and 33 Democrats. We couldn't even uh, sustain a veto uh, of the governor. We had to count on the, um, the Senate to do that. Uh, so now that we have 55 Democrats and 45 Republicans, it's uh, a whole different experience in Richmond. Um, I tell people I went from having one committee which never met and another committee where I had no subcommittee assignments. Now I'm on four committees. I'm the vice chair of one of those. I'm on seven subcommittees. I chair three of my subcommittees. So I'm on the housing commission. I'm on the code commission, the board of veteran services. Um, so very busy um, person these days, which is great. I'm glad to have the, uh, the confidence of Speaker Fillercorn that she, she gives me all these things to do. Uh, so I'm excited to be here and chat with you guys a little bit about campaign finance reform. I will say that it is one of those issues that got backburned. You know, with all the things we tried to do the first session, um, we did the gun violence prevention. We passed seven of the governor's eight gun bills that he proposed last summer session. Uh, we, we did a great deal on equality. Uh, we passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, we passed the Virginia Values Act. Uh, we added a number of protected classes uh, in Virginia's employment law. Uh, we expanded voting rights. We've got no excuse absentee voting. Repealed the photo portion of the voter ID statute. Uh, we uh, did environmental. We passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act. Uh, you know, very, very busy on a number of fronts, uh, but we couldn't do everything this year. And two of the things that sort of uh, people got a little were disappointed, I guess, is maybe the, the, they, they would have liked to see us move on these things as well, were campaign finance reform and criminal justice reform. And I think with both of those- no, Wait, wait, don't, don't say it all now though, because we want to come back to you and ask you. <laughs> all right, well, all right, I will save it. That's no, no, what no, say, save, uh, don't, don't uncork the, the champagne, keep the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will, I'll come back to, to, to that. Part of it was like you said, we have to have two years to do things, but I will let's let some of the other folks talk and we'll talk more about why it is. We, we, get you. Post we, we want post you to tell us, we just don't want you to tell us up front. <laughs> Got it. Don't spoil it. Okay. Thank you so much, Marcus, for um, introducing the subject and also kind of connecting with everyone here. Um, I'm really happy to be able to present this tonight. Um, this has been one of my issues, you know, money and politics sucks. So I'm so happy to have met Nancy Morgan and for her to bring her compassion and passion for this issue. So I'd like to introduce Nancy Morgan. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, thank you, Stair. And thanks to everybody for joining us on this and during this tumultuous time. I'm the coordinator of American Promise. So what is American Promise? Well, American Promise was ultimately the aspiration given our, to our founding fathers to have a, a government for and by the people. And 400 later, years later, here we are in Virginia, and basically American Promise is a national organization, nonpartisan, working to get money out of politics, first through the avenue of amending the Constitution to allowing Congress and the states to go back to regulating campaign finance. And that's basically overturning Citizens United. And then as we set up here a couple of years in Virginia, we just looked around our pay-to-play state and said, hey, you know, we Virginia is only one of four states that has no limitations on campaign finance. So we need to address um, this issue. And that's why my passion, I care about climate change, gun safety, everything like that, but it, everything boils down to money. So I know where my passion is. So Stare, let's check the pulse of the audience and feel, and, and so that we know what they, they care about. So everybody, here's a, a poll that we put together. How concerned about you or money in politics? It should be fairly easy. One is not very much. Ten, it is one of my primary concerns. So just go through 
Oh, and I can't vote, which is so undemocratic. Okay, so yes, so so Nancy, that was one of the things that I wanted to, you know what, I forgot to click that button before I launched the poll. So if everybody would just go ahead and vote and we'll give it just a little bit of time here. So we've almost given it 40 seconds. We're getting only a few votes in here. We're getting a few more in um, question number two. It is, no, it's take your time actually because it is three questions. So I think. Are they um, seeing all three you, at once? Huh? You had a message from somebody and you can't hit submit. So I don't know. Oh dear. Can't hit submit. Okay. So some people are able to hit submit because I'm getting submitting in. And. We'll just do the best we can here. Scroll down, there are three questions. It says, yes, scroll down, right, good. You have answer all three. Okay, so we're figuring it out together. And all right, so let's just give it another 10 seconds and we'll breathe deeply and exhale fully. Okay, all right, I'm gonna end the poll. All right. Okay, do we have the results? We do have the results. We don't, don't, so let's don't, see. don't give them away oh. yet. You oh. Oh, okay. oh, oh, okay. 77% oh. 70, okay. say it's very important. <laughs> That's great. It's interesting. This is a very diverse, uh, this is the question of how confident that the problem can be addressed with 12% uh, sort of middle of the road. 27% though feel that they can actually, it actually can be resolved. And how, do you feel that you can do something to make a difference? Hey, Hendrick, look at this. 96% say that they, they, they can do something about it. That defeats the Lawrence Lessing thing where he said 90, 90% people, people care about the issue and only like 10% feel that they can do something about uh, it. This so, is a hot crowd. Good than that, yeah, we got a good crowd. So just in the introduction to our panel, over the next hour, we're gonna examine the corrosive impact of money on our democracy and look at what we as citizens can do about it. And I'm so excited we have a great panel who will examine, first of all, what have citizens group movements been doing around the country? Hedrick will look at national, and Vicki, my colleague, Vicki Barnes, will look at from from the Minnesota perspective and what's happening there. And then we'll identify how we in Virginia can make a difference in moving forward a legislative agenda addressing this issue. And that's why we're so excited to have the three, you know, three or four star general of campaign, you know, who support the supporter of campaign finance, Marcus Simon, to really give us some insights in what's happening in the General Assembly. But let's start off with Hedrick. Hedrick is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the new, he worked for 26 years at the new, in the New York Times. And for those of us who are older, you may remember the Russians uh, that he wrote, I think it was in the 70s. And then most recently that he's the author of Who Stole the American Dream. And now he is really at the forefront in terms of documenting what is happening in terms of uh, grassroots movements, democracy movements around the country. Most recently, he um, produced, uh, his newest work is The Democracy Rebellion. It was produced, it's a PBS doc, one hour documentary that showed in January and showing how grassroots citizen movements are win winning victories for political reform state by state. So I think that we're delighted that ha to have Hedrick here and I'll just turn the proverbial microphone or the Great. Zoom screen over to you, Hedrick. Great, thank you so much. Well, it's a real pleasure. Um, delighted you all are doing this. Uh, this is a season, as we all see it uh, all day long, of citizen activism in American politics. Uh, you know, it, the issue is George Floyd and, and what happened up in, uh, in, in police brutality, but it's a demonstration that people are really involved and engaged. Uh, 2018, actually, in terms of political reform, uh, whether you're talking voting rights or gerrymander reform or 
uh, money in politics or ranked choice voting, whatever you're talking about, 2018 was the best year that we've had in American politics on political reform in 50 years. And of course, you in Virginia have already kicked off 2020, as Senator Simon was, uh, Representative Simon was saying a little while ago, uh, that uh, that 2020 in the Virginia legislature was a really hot session. You did do uh, something on gerrymander reform. You did a whole lot of uh, things uh, in the House of Delegates and in the Senate uh, on voting rights reform, uh, and much more is to come. What's interesting is it's probably true that the last several years of political reform was really triggered by the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, the decision which kind of uh, unleashed the floodgates, uh, let all kinds of money come into politics. You saw it just skyrocketing. You'll see in the, in the video segment we're going to show you just skyrocketing money uh, flooding into the uh, political system in the wake of the Citizens United decision. Something really struck a chord, and as Nancy said, American Promise is focused on this issue, on trying to pass the 28th Amendment. What's interesting is you're, you're addressing this in Virginia at a point at which 20 states, 20 of the 50 states have already gone on record one way or another, either with a popular vote, a vote in the legislature, a combined letter from the governor and the legislative leaders to Congress saying, we want a constitutional amendment, a US constitutional amendment that will roll back Citizens United, that will give back uh, to the Congress and to the states the power to regulate campaign funding, how much is spent, how much is raised, um, what's disclosed, uh, who's the giver, who's the receiver, uh, who might be buying influence and who might be trading away influence. All that got suspended to some degree by the Supreme Court's decision in 2010. Uh, and you saw an immediate impact. In 2009, I think something like uh, $8 million of independent expenditures occurred, 8 million. In 2010, uh, it was 300 million. And in 2015, it was a billion and a half, 2015, 2016. So it just shot up. It had an enormous impact, that decision. And so that's the issue uh, that you're gonna be looking at. I think, Nancy, we can probably go ahead and roll uh, the video and just let people see this is a this is a, a what I did is I went around the country I was interested in what actual ordinary people were doing what's amazing you'll see grassroots heroes and here they are in Washington state putting something together and these are political amateurs these are people like you and me okay let's go years ago we had an American revolution to make sure that we got democracy in this country well, today starts the new American Revolution. To make sure that we get our democracy back. So, brothers and sisters, are you ready to stand up? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to march? Yes, we can! Yes, we can! Democracy awakening, they call it. Thousands of protesters massing in Washington. All over the country, Americans are fed up. And rebelling against the politicians and the power brokers. Fighting against Citizens United. We do not believe that corporations are people. Voter suppression. We will never stop battling. Dark money. The money was hopping from one nonprofit to another, all for the purpose of concealing donors. Gerrymandering. The real work on redistricting was being done behind closed doors. Pressing for reform. If this singing and these chants up on the Capitol steps remind you of the civil rights movement, it should. This is Americans protesting, in this case, against big money in politics, for voting rights, against gerrymandering, against a broken political system. We are 99%. We are. But as I interview Mark's leaders, I wonder, can it work? Can ordinary voters hold what many see as politicians rigging elections? Can citizen reformers stop the big money that they fear is dominating elections? It's happened before. We the people demanding our rights. 
A century ago in the progressive era, mass protests won women's right to vote, direct election of senators, Congress outlawing corporate spending in elections. The 1960s, another rebellion, a grassroots movement challenging the power structure and winning change. Martin Luther King and the March on Washington. Selma, Alabama, and the fight for black voting rights. Today, partisan gridlock blocks change in Washington. And so once again, the grassroots are riled up and rising up state by state. It's the kind of story I've seen before. In the 1960s, I covered the civil rights protests in the Deep South, reported on the Vietnam War in Saigon. The Cold War in Gorbachev's perestroika from Moscow and covered six American presidents. Today, the states are where the action is on reform. So it's time for me to get out into the country to take the measure of the new wave of grassroots rebellions. First stop, Seattle. Puget Sound, the famous Pike Street Market. I find people gathering for picnic lunch. Fishmongers draw a crowd tossing salmon. It's a peaceful, sunny September day. But rebellion is brewing. So what we're doing today is we're gonna cover the market. A band of volunteers have come to galvanize support for a statewide vote on an initiative to curb billionaire and corporate money in political campaigns, hoping to pressure Congress to take action. Primarily, we're targeting voters that don't know about our initiative, because um, you know the recent polling showed 36% are undecided. It's initiative 735. Hey, thank you. We need to put the power of the vote back into the hands of the people so that the wealthy entities will no longer have a pipeline. Linda Bach is a modern Paul Revere, awakening the popular rebellion. She collected 21,000 signatures to help put Initiative I-735 on the 2016 ballot. I've long had the idea that I am continuing the American Revolution. Every signature I get is just another check for the Constitution and the power of we the people. Democracy, you must fight for it or it'll slip right out of your hands. Fear that mega money is corrupting our democracy has turned average Americans like Cindy Black into reformers. I definitely think the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United has unleashed so much money in our system that it's ceased being a democracy. And now we've turned into an oligarchy. In the Citizens United decision in January 2010, the Supreme Court overturned a century old ban on corporate political spending. It ruled that corporations can spend freely now on political campaigns. Justice John Paul Stevens dissented. Corporations, he said, already have political action committees, but allowing them unlimited use of their vast treasuries, he warned, unleashes the floodgates. Stevens was prophetic. Suddenly, unregulated campaign spending by independent political groups shot up from $8 million in 2009 to 301 million in 2010 to 1.4 billion in the 2016 election. Changing the Constitution is a big step. In reaction to the Citizens United decision, Senate Democrats pushed for a constitutional amendment to restore the power of Congress to regulate campaign spending, but party line Republican opposition blocked the move. The motion is not agreed to. So reformers shifted to the states. Several legislatures called on Congress to roll back Citizens United. 800 cities joined. In Colorado and Montana, 74% bipartisan supermajorities voted against Citizens United. In Washington state, volunteer activist Cindy Black leads the charge for ballot initiative 735. And just by a show of hands, how many of you collected signatures for 735 out there? Give everybody a round of applause, those folks. Um, 
because we collected um, 293,000 of our signatures were collected by volunteers. So I have never run a campaign before. I'm really a grassroots organizer. I was in the Air Force. I was a, a crew chief and then I went to college. I was a marriage and family therapist for quite a few years and then running my own business. The Black is the spark plug of a statewide citizen movement. We're trying to get our citizens, our voters on record, saying that we do not believe that corporations are people. We do not believe that money is speech and that we think that political contribution should be regulated and made public. But others like corporate investment analyst Kelly Houghton sharply disagree. I do not want to touch the First Amendment. And this effort, I-735, seeks to restrict the freedom of speech of certain groups of people who come together to form corporations. Citizens United was quite simply a corporation formed for the purpose of engaging in political speech in the form of a movie that Hillary Clinton didn't like. If our forefathers really believed that corporations were people, I think they would have put that in the Constitution, and it is nowhere to be seen. Voting on this issue, would you like? Okay, they want to censor corporate speech. Let's think about all the things out there that are corporations. Seattle Times, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the New York Times, CNN, Fox News, we cannot afford as a country to censor corporations engaging in free speech. We do not want anything to limit free speech for the press or freedom of the press, not, and not at all. What we're talking about is limiting money in elections. <laughs> Black has a statewide network of volunteers from the Idaho border to the Pacific coast. It's not about left or right. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, or other. Yeah. We just want government that represents you, not to make big case for money. But how can amateurs win without big funding? I've talked to professional politicians in this state. They say it takes $3 million to run a successful political campaign in Washington yes. State. You don't have $3 million. No. So what does it take to win? in a big state here, Washington State. We talk to people. That's how we're doing it. Contact, direct voter contact, person to person. Let me tell your friends and family. Okay. You can pass an initiative with a grassroots effort with a small budget. We can do it. And they did it. 63% of Washington State voters rejected Citizens United and unlimited corporate money in campaigns. It takes 34 states to force Congress to act on a constitutional amendment. 20 states are now on record against Citizens United. Getting 14 more is the next challenge. I know you all want to get into a discussion about this, but let me just underline a couple of points in that story. Washington State is different from Virginia in the but sense that in Washington, still can you hear me all right? Uncertainties about it next month, oh. about next fall, about the Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, Washington State is one of those uh, citizen referendum states. There are 26 in the country. Most of them in the West uh, got their constitutions late, and the ones in the East, uh, particularly the original ones, uh, the action has to go through the legislature. But the kind of organizing that you see underway in Washington state, the kind of people who are involved, uh, the bipartisan nature of it, the involvement of citizen amateurs, uh, has been replicated in other states like Ohio and Connecticut, which also uh, require or, or take legislative action. So this, the, the grassroots movement that you're seeing uh, is a demonstration that people power can work. Uh, you certainly had a change in the mood of your legislature uh, with the blue waves that you had that this, uh, the delegate was talking about earlier you know, in 2017 and 2019. Popular pressure from below is what led to this tremendous change from a two-thirds Republican majority in the House of Delegates to a Democratic majority. So public pressure works. I think that's important. Secondly, a lot of people feel that as political amateurs, it's pretty tough for them to get involved and have an impact. Look at for a moment, think for a moment uh, of this woman, Cindy Black. 
She was a crew chief in the Air Force when she came out of high school. Uh, she became a family therapist. Uh, she runs her own uh, small business. Uh, this is a woman who had no particular background in politics, except as a volunteer, except getting into this kind of campaign. And she did a terrific job. Uh, and they got lots and lots of volunteers involved. So it shows you that amateurs can get involved. One point here that's really important to stress is that this was a very bipartisan coalition. It stretched across from Democrats to independents to Republicans. And one of the interesting things that I found out, particularly with regard to Virginia, is that you have very conservative Republicans who are upset by the power of big money, of billionaire money, of corporate money, of foreign money, of out-of-state money, uh, coming into whatever state you're in, whether it's, whether it's Virginia or Minnesota or South Dakota or Washington State. John Pudner, who is a very uh, experienced and talented uh, Republican conservative campaign strategist. He ran the David Bratt campaign. Uh, that, that won the seat for Brat in Virginia in Congress uh, a few years back. Brat got beaten the last time around. But Pudner uh, complained, I remember talking to John any number of times, and he'd say, it's just unfair to the, to the person who can donate 50 or 100 or 150 or $200 uh, and a candidate who isn't well known, uh, who has to raise money that way, the big money system is terrible. So you have a guy like that who's way over on the political right, uh, combining with people on the left and in the middle to fight the problem of big money. So this is something that stretches across the political spectrum. Uh, and that, you know, that's a very important element. Uh, the fact that you've got 20 states that have already taken action, and they're, it's amazing the number of cities. I mean, you can go from New York to Los Angeles, but you can also do uh, you know, the Ozark towns in Arkansas or Carbondale, Illinois, or just in the Wisconsin primary uh, last month, uh, no, last month in April, uh, there were something like 18 local cities and counties that passed resolutions uh, calling for the rollback of Citizens United to try to put influence and pressure on the Wisconsin legislature, because in Wisconsin, as in Virginia, the action has to be taken by the legislature. So there's all kinds of evidence that the ferment and the uh, outrage in some ways that has been caused by the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court's reversal, remember this, I don't know if you caught it, could have gone by pretty fast. In 1907, in 1907, under Teddy Roosevelt, with William Howard Taft in the wings, under Republicans, the Congress passed a law that barred corporate contributions to campaigns. And that stood for a century. It was the Supreme Court that reversed that rule. So we're going back now when we're talking about uh, uh, limiting, regulating, exposing, bringing out the dark money and the big money. We're talking about going back to an American tradition. This is not new, it's something we need to get back to. So there's all that context. People power works, amateurs can do it, it is bipartisan, and it's part of our history. Those are all themes that are really important for you all to think about in Virginia as you tackle that issue. And we'll get into how that's gonna work. Nancy, back to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, here's a, a citizen's advocate here. Um, and please, people put uh, questions in the Q&A if you have any questions. I must say, you know, this is sometimes how I feel, but every time I'm around Hedrick, I feel a little bit more empowered. So let's just take a look at Virginia and let's just turn back the clock 50 years, almost 50 years to the day. So here we are sitting here in Richmond and there's uh, Lewis Powell, who was a corporate lawyer at the time, talking to the head of the Chamber of Commerce, who was also from Richmond. And they elaborated in a memo, the famous Powell memo, a statement saying the American econ economic system is under broad attack. And the message was business must acquire political power. And uh, he was nominated just two months later to the US Supreme Court. And he's had such an impact in terms of after, in response to the Powell memo, the business roundtable was formed and became Corporate America's uh, strongest political lobbying arm. And by the end of the decade, the US Chamber of Commerce had doubled its memberships in corporations and corporate executives funded a large number of, of legal foundations. 
So when you go back, that's how Virginia got involved. And then you had in 1976, Buckley versus Vallejo, which was really the whole idea of uh, corporations of people went back to the mid 1800s and the railways. But this was really the first time the Supreme Court actually mentioned the issue of money as speech. And they put limits on election spending, um, at, at saying that they were unconstitutional. And then there was a series of um, rulings, and it's very interesting when you look at the Roberts Court, they came in in 2000, and he came in in 2005, and uh, Alito came in 2006. There were six rulings that progressively took away rights of people and gave them to corporations, and as Hedrick said, it culminated in Citizens United versus the FEC, which basically threw out restrictions on corporate spending. It set up a, a, for the floodgate of of money from super PACs and nonprofit organization, the dark money, the uh, 501c4s that existed. And then you had Mc a continued uh, rulings on McCutcheon versus the FEC, where we have limits in federal, I can give $2,800 to an elected official, but they said they opened it up in terms of, you can give as much money to as many people as you want. So what did the political uh, impact, legislative impacts, and Hedrick mentioned this, and 24 states had actually legislation on campaign finance, the most famous of, of which is documented in, in dark money, the, the issue of uh, Montana, which had 100 years of uh, regulations on campaign finance. Um, and, and Alaska had, they had limits on money coming from out of the states. Virginia, we had no, we weren't in that list because basically we have no limitations on campaign finance. So one of the things, and I put this in so I can remember to come back to Virginia, for those of you who are into money and politics trivia, Citizens United was a Virginia company. So what was the impact of that? I think the graph says it all there. It was just crazy, and, and Hedrick mentioned this too, but it really is visible in a, in a, in a graph. 2018, $5.8 billion of campaign spending. And in Virginia, it's interesting that in the 10th district, uh, which is Barbara Comstock uh, and uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Wexton, that was the ninth most expensive race in the country. And when you look at it, we're on track. I took this from Open Secrets. We're on track. And if anybody wants to put a bet up, I bet we're going to be over $7 billion. And what are the impacts? Obviously, the candidates uh, with the most money wins. We only have like 10% of our elections are competitive. Uh, Two-thirds of political donations come from less than 0.5% of the population. And I'm sure Marcus can attest to this. You know, any, any legislator, do you really want to spend 30 to 70% of your time fundraising? And then finally, and we can look at cases like in this with Virginia in terms of uh, payday lending, well, that changed, I guess, this time, or Dominion, but public policies don't represent the public, public good. And in Virginia, we have our play to state, uh, play, pay to play state. We have the same same graph. You look at 2019; it was it was the wild wild west out there. It was like 121 million dollars were spent on our elections. 25 million came from out of state, and that's nearly double what it was before before Citizens United. And I just like to give you a great example. This was in District 40, who was at Dan Helmer's uh, uh, district. He's a great guy. We all really like Dan. $3.8 million for that election. It was, that is just wrong. And it has nothing to do with the candidates. This is the system. You know, you have pay $3.8 million for, for a position that pays $18,000 a year. So what we need in addition to getting Virginia to be the 21st state that passes the resolution supporting overturning Citizens United, we need to have campaign finance bills passed in the legislature. And that's what we're hoping to get insights from Marcus on. Um, specifically, there were probably about 10 bills introduced and Marcus can tell you this too. They had some in, in his Privileges and Elections Committee that I guess one or two very minor ones were passed. But in the Senate, it was fascinating because they had at least two hearings on this issue. There were two bills. One is really important. I mean, both relatively important. As one is putting limits on campaign finance, which died nine to, nine to six. It was the Democrats that voted it down. 
And then there was the, the Dominion bill, not the Dominion bill, but basically banning corporate money from co public service corporations. They both died. So that was sort of set the tone. It was very fascinating to watch those debates. And Marcus can tell us what happened in the House. I think that basically they saw what was happening in the Senate. There were so many bills and, and basically they sort of um, disappeared. And so we couldn't get anybody to introduce a resolution endorsing a constitutional amendment. I think that there were a lot of bills, and, but there's also an issue is this is a memorializing bill, so it's never quite sure, we're never quite sure where they go when they're introduced. We had Dallin Hay Homer was going to introduce one, and, and also Sam Rizal had one binding to an Article 5 convention, which is a, a different issue. So nothing passed. So what are we doing as a group? Well, we're a small group, but we're trying to do build awareness about the corrosive impact of money, get Virginia to be the 21st state to pass this resolution, support campaign finance. In, in Virginia, how are we doing it? There's Marcus Simon up on the top right. We go down to Richmond and we lobby. We go to the, the, the Congress and we lobby our representatives to support the two the companion bills in the House and the Senate. We visit with our legislature, we do outreach, and we're getting very good luck in terms of getting people to sign our pledge. Here we have uh, Jerry Conley, Don Beyer, I'm so glad that they, Dan Helmer signed it. We're writing letters to the editor, we're working with like Fairfax County to see if we can get this included in their, their legislative agenda for the next General Assembly. So politics to play is a losing proposition, we all know that. And, we're all very excited because, and Hedrick said, this is a great year. Last year was a great year. This was a great year for Virginia. Extraordinary progress in dem democracy reforms, voting rights, ranked choice voting, which I'm really excited about redistricting. We have a Democratic legislature and governor. 75% of um, Americans support this. Business also supports this. 85% of CEOs recognize that our campaign system is broken. And in Virginia, we're trying to work with American business, American Promise business groups to build advocacy among business. And we've set up a discussion group. The challenges, and I'm hoping, you know, that Marcus can help us out and Vicki, if she has examples from Minnesota, finding a champion for the bill, what is the status of memorializing resolutions and overcoming resistance in the Senate to campaign finance reform because we had a Zoom call with a very a senior um, Senate uh, senator from the Privileges and Elections, and he was saying basically you have to wait to because there's even resistance among senior Democrats on this. And I'm I'm hoping that we can find out some shortcuts in terms of that, you know mobilizing grassroots to, to support this because everybody is stronger and is. JFK said, I think this is a good time to talk to, you know, quote JFK, democracy only works when it works for everyone. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a good discussion with our panelists on how we can move ahead. Thanks, Hedrick. You want to take it over? Sure, thanks. My, that's a great rundown, and Nancy has a really good exposition of the situation uh, in general and, and the background. Uh, so, uh, Delegate Simon, if I can call you Marcus. Um, sure. You know, Nancy has referred to some of the procedural uh, maneuvers. Let's don't get into that right away. Let me just ask you what the, your sense of uh, the other delegates is on the issue of money and politics. I mean, people sort of presume that it's one side versus the other, but often I've found that uh, citizens are all in favor of these reforms that, that limit uh, money in politics, but politicians of both parties who've succeeded in getting into office with the current system, you know, they'll say the right thing in public, but privately they're willing to go along with the current system. If you just had to gauge the sentiment across the aisle and in your own party, is there a mood at the moment that you could see in the next session? that some kind of campaign finance bill could pass, either making Virginia the 21st state to call for a constitutional amendment to roll back Citizens United, or some kind of uh, regulation of campaign funding in Virginia? Or is it a pretty much of an uphill struggle? Are we, are we public or private right now? Is this a public <laughs> answer or a private answer? Well, uh, you got you got <laughs> seventy seven people or something like that listening. All right, pretty hard to well, be. So, so uh, it, I, 
it's interesting. How, again, I, I told you it's been there's been a lot of good things um, about going from being in the minority and the opposition to being in the majority. Um, but one of the things that is different is your outlook on things. I mean, when you're in the opposition, it's much easier to be against big money in politics because, frankly, a lot of that money flows to the majority party, right? And it's not so much ideological. They're going to where the power centers are. So committee chairs draw a lot of corporate contributions. A lot of money from the from payday lenders was one example, right, that uh, would go to the chairman of commerce and labor. Uh, now, payday lending, I mean, the good news on that is um, that one is just so antithetical to the Democratic core values uh, that we passed legislation um, over the objection of the payday lending industry. And we heard just, I think, today that one of the big payday lenders has left the state of Virginia because they can no longer do business here under our new rules. And to that, a lot of us say boo-hoo, right? Um, so I thought you were going, I thought you were going to say now that you're in the majority, it's a little bit harder to be well, again. But that said, yes, being in the majority, it is, uh, it, it changes the dynamics a little bit, right? Because as Nancy also said, nobody wants to spend 70 to 80% of your time chasing down contributions, $500, $600, $800 at a time. Um, it's just very time consuming. So there's a great temptation to say, well, I can make a bunch of calls. But, but you, haven't, you, haven't really, you haven't really you said what the sentiment is. 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 all in one fell swoop, and maybe it won't influence me that much, right? So I think, yes, when you're in the majority, it's, it's harder to be as Dr. Newman. So without saying it directly, you sort of said that the Democrats are really sort of, some of the Democrats who are really in favor of campaign finance reform aren't so hot for it now, and it's got an uphill struggle? I wouldn't say that. I just say it's like it becomes a lower priority, right? When it's when it's not keeping the other side in power, but maybe potentially has to, to keep you in power, it, de it definitely becomes a lower priority. I don't think that that's uh, telling any secrets or anything that you guys couldn't have probably put together uh, yourselves. Let me try out a question that I saw flash from one of the the viewers here. Um, somebody said, "I'm jealous of those states where they have citizen ballot initiatives." Uh, what if the politicians, the uh, Democrats as well as the Republicans, wanted to duck the issue of campaign finance reform and, and turn it over to the citizens? Do you think there's any chance in the world that even the Democratic majority in the state legislature would pass constitutional amendments that allowed for ballot initiatives to be initiated by citizens in Virginia as they are in 26 other states? Uh, I don't see that coming anytime soon in Virginia. I mean, just to be very honest with you. Um, I mean, it's not a lack. It, 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 there, there are plenty of other ways to duck the issues um, and, and maintain some sort of control and influence over the outcome. Um, so, I, you know, it's hard to get state legislators to, 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 to give up power, right? I mean, it's a power dynamic. We finally have it after 24, 25 years. Um, and you guys want us to just give it all over to the citizens. No, I mean, that's, you know, that's, it's not an I easy. I appreciate your candor. I appreciate your candor. So, is there a route? Can you see a route? Are there any prospects? If you, uh, is there a way of? Uh, is there an element of? It? I mean, one of the things that I was intrigued with talking to John Pudner, who, after all, was when the Republicans were in charge of the legislature, and and the Republicans had the majority in the in the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives. He is really upset about the idea of foreign money being spent in American uh, campaigns. And lots of these American corporations have turned themselves into foreign corporations, um, you know, and so suddenly, uh, you know, there's an American drug company that is really the American arm of what is now an Irish drug company. He's very upset about foreign money, very upset about out-of-state money. Is there any way that, that a piece of legislation that was fairly narrowly focused or even focused on disclosure of who the donors are. I mean, is there any part of that that's got a chance that you could see moving in the legislature in the next session? Yes. I mean, I think a couple of things. I think somebody in the chat has suggested maybe a fairly high limit, like $6,000. I could see there being an appetite for, I think the governor, Governor Northam proposed a $10,000 contribution cap. I mean, it's a very big number, but it's a cap. It starts to say, and there's bipartisan support for that because at some point, the lack of a limit becomes dangerous for incumbents, right? So when you have a wealthy hedge fund manager in Charlottesville who decides to give $100,000 to a delegate candidate, that's 
all of a sudden you know, to, a, to, a, to a challenger, you know, that becomes very concerning to incumbents, right? When somebody who wants to can buy, essentially buy a state legislative seat because they have no limit, whoever it is, whether it's an individual, a philanthropist, a corporate raider, whoever it is, you know, that, that's worrisome. So I think there's probably some appetite for limits. Um, I think there's probably an appetite for some sort of disclosures. All right, we have we disclose everything, but it's pretty easy to get around our disclosure requirements by creating, you can create an LLC that does nothing but raise money. You don't have to disclose who the members are. Um, I think there, there have been some proposals floated um, to, for instance, when a corporation makes contributions to require uh, a, a, board, a vote of the board of directors in favor of each of their contributions. So something goes on the record, create some, some hurdles um, and some, some required votes, like things like that. I think that has some potential. I think, frankly, my, my preferred idea, and I don't know, honestly, I don't know if it'll have much legs or not. I, I like what they do in Washington State. You, did, you spent some time in your video in Washington. I like the idea of, of some form of public finance of elections um, that ties your, if you agree to limits, you agree to disclosure, you agree to uh, certain conditions, you get to participate in a public finance program. And the one that I like is, is the democracy voucher program that they do in, in Washington state, right. um, where you get, that, that really empowers people uh, to make small donations. It empowers people that aren't really part of that giving class to participate. Uh, and it creates another avenue for, I mean, I had all my constituents had a $25 voucher. Um, I'd be out knocking on doors and I'd be doing dual purpose canvassing. I'd be canvassing for their support, for their vote, Oh, and by the way, if you really like what I have to say, how about your voucher? Um, I think there, there, there are a bunch of really good incentives that can be built into a system like that. Um, the question is right now, given the, the difficult budget times we have, how we- you think, do, you think that would, do you think there'd be much sentiment? Do you think there'd be much sentiment for that uh, on your committee or, or in the legislature, public finance? Well, you know, it's gonna, maybe part of my candor is, is also a little bit of cynicism because there seemed like there was support for it uh, among my caucus mates until we took over. <laughs> and I introduced the bill this year. Um, and even as the vice chair of the committee, I couldn't get it voted on. So, um, you know, I do think there is some sentiment for it. We got to figure out how to pay for it yep. and where, what, what the funding mechanism is. But I think that that's one that's got some potential. Um, may I, Hedrick, may I just in, have an interjection? Because we've been discussing with the Campaign Legal Center, and I brought up that question because I really like Delegate Simon's bill, I just think that's great. But in fact, you can't have an effective public system, public financing of elections unless you have limitations on. Thank you, but, but, yeah, on but what, okay, but, but, but what they did in Connecticut, and by the way, if people are interested in this, they really should take a look at the Connecticut segment of the Democracy Rebellion, that documentary. It's up on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, on a channel called The People Versus the Politicians. Connecticut has public financing of elections along with a total ban on donations over a hundred dollars but the way it gets through the supreme court is it's voluntary in other words the candidates have to agree to the limit on donations in order to get the public funding and that's how it stands uh, up and hasn't been thrown out by the U.S. Supreme Court. I, I, we could go on talking about the Virginia situation, but I wonder whether or not we ought to bring in Vicki Barnes at the moment and get some insights from, from Minnesota, where some of these same issues are going on, where you have the same kind of problem uh, in Minnesota that you have in Virginia, namely that it is the legislature, it is the politicians themselves that have to wind up by voting uh, as, as Marcus said just a few moments ago, either giving up power or giving up the power to raise money or whatever it is. Let me just ask you, Vicki, what, what do you think citizens' grassroots movements can do? What have you seen from your experience? What can they do to influence a legislature where some of the members are inclined to go for things? As Marcus said, part of his caucus was a, a for it. Um, and the question is, can citizen power begin to swing the balance? What do you think and what have you seen? Well, I, if I didn't think that, I, I wouldn't be doing this. I tell you, it's, um, it's tricky. Um, and we're a divided legislature. So uh, our, uh, the Republicans have the Senate right now and the Democrats have the House. And I, had too, have seen some changes in the way Democrats feel about things now that they see that maybe they might possibly take the Senate too. 
Um, for example, redistricting uh, resolutions or laws aren't as important as they were before. Um, however, um, I, if you can grow your movement broad enough uh, and get conservatives in it, uh, you, can, you can make progress. And that's the way to, um, to get in touch with the Republican lawmakers. You basically have to have conservatives uh, working with them uh, on this issue to make sure that they understand it's, it's, a, it's a bipartisan movement. And even though um, having to go against leadership to support the resolution calling on an amendment, uh, they will do that if they have the backing of their constituents. And they have to feel that. Uh, we had uh, one, uh, one of the Republican senators had uh, introduced a bill, the Wolfpack bill into the legislature uh, calling on uh, a constitutional convention to reverse Citizens United. And a, a couple of months or a couple of weeks after that, he took his name off the bill. So, um, so I went in and I asked him, you know, what happened there? And he said that he had done that because the, the group had approached him, but he started to get phone calls and a lot of flack from leadership and he didn't feel like he had any skin in the game. So when he, he came on board, we were able to meet with, uh, through our members, a Republican senator um, who had the office right next to him, who was interested in uh, the resolution calling on the amendment. Um, however, he didn't care for the, the bill that was in uh, the legislature at that time. He felt like it was too liberal. So this original senator who'd taken his name off the Wolfpack bill worked with us um, and we rewrote the, the bill so that it appealed a little more to conservatives with just tweaking the language here and there. Uh, still the same bill, and we were able to get that introduced. But you, they, they both had the backing. Yeah. You're starting to get into what kind of techniques work. I mean, this is, you're, you're really experienced at this. Um, what, what kind of movements, what kind of things work? I mean, does it make sense to look for tippy legislative districts, uh, Senate districts, House districts, whatever, uh, and try to bring, uh, uh, organize the public in those districts so that you can bring some pressure to bear from the voters on the winner, whether it's Democrat or Republican, uh, or it, does it make much more sense to try to do what you were just describing a moment ago, which is very detailed nitty gritty work with individual uh, members so that you're getting sponsors and co-sponsors of legislation. What kind of things work? Well, that's how I actually ran into the senators is that I had done research at the beginning of the session to see, because um, the senators weren't up for election this past uh, session, and to see how their districts voted in 2016 and to see which ones might be vulnerable. And, and so that perhaps this would give them a leg up if they campaigned on this issue, knowing that um, a number of their constituents or the majority of their constituents would support their uh, efforts to get money out of politics. So, so doing that background work to see who might be vulnerable was very helpful. Getting members in their district was really what what paid off. So um, as, as you build- Wait, wait, wait. What, what do you mean by getting members in the district? Members of American Promise. So as we build the grassroots movement and you, you, know, you start out, I started out in 2016 with American Promise. I launched in 2017 here in Minnesota and I was new to Minnesota. I didn't know anybody. Um, and gradually over this you know, past three years, we now have 200 members. So as I was in the cities, which is completely blue, a, a, just a Democrat bubble. So it was difficult for me to, um, to reach out to uh, conservative lawmakers and conservatives because I didn't run into them. But gradually over that time, we've expanded outside of the cities into areas where there are conservative and Republican uh, leadership. What, for, what, uh, what, aspects, what aspects of the money issue, money and politics issue, do you find kind of reach across uh, party lines? Is it the out-of-state money? Is it the foreign money? Is it some kind of limit on, as, uh, as, as uh, Marcus was talking about before, the big donation, which can actually frighten a, a, an incumbent or an incumbents in general? Uh, or is it, is it public disclosure? Where do you find that there's uh, the ingredients for the political recipe for some kind of success? States' rights. 
They don't like people coming from outside of state to spend money here. And also, you know, when you talk to a Republican lawmaker, and they're they're usually you know pretty candid with me. Um, you know, one said, I don't think this resolution goes far enough. I think only people who live in the district should be able to give money. I, I think only voters in eligible to vote in the district should be able to donate money. They they feel very strongly about the state's rights issues. So so that that helps out a lot. Um, foreign money also. I mean that's a big one, but. And I tell them, even you know, if they pass this stuff, they pass this stuff, believe it or not, in North Dakota. Do you remember that? It's just next door to you. Uh, and there's a group up there called the Badass Grandmas in North Dakota, a couple of women in their either late 60s or early 70s. And they managed to do the same thing. And the, the hot button issues were out of state and foreign money and lobbyist yeah. money as well. But I mean, it was out of state and foreign was a big way. It was the opening wedge that began yeah. to bring people together. And, and the state legislators don't, in Minnesota, we have campaign finance regulations and we do have, uh, we have uh, funding of elections, public funding. We could each uh, write $50, you know, $100 off our taxes. Um, but a lot of legislators, the candidates have to, they, they don't wanna do that because they need to raise more money than that's allowed. Um, but that's the, um, that's the big part when when we're talking states' rights and um, and foreign money and th and the Republicans w that I talk to agree with this, but when it comes down to getting leadership on board, it just doesn't happen. And that's actually on the, the party division here that we have. Do you, see any, do you see any change in the attitude of candidates running for office? People deciding they want to run for the state legislature. Is there a difference between the crop that's running today and say it was running five years ago on the issues of money and politics? More and more, more and more they're, they campaign on that issue. And um, I look forward to having some people running for Republican party uh, positions also supporting this. Um, let me uh, let me flip that question back to Marcus. Marcus, uh, you know, from your experience, do you see in Virginia that there are more candidates who are now talking about uh, some kind of limits on campaign funding as part of their running for office? That it's a more popular issue to run on now. Yeah, so it's it's in the uh, yes and no, right? It, it depends on on the nature of the limitation. Uh, I just said in the chat, you know, this issue of out of state money. Republicans are very much now big fans of limiting out-of-state money because what's happened is that uh, the out-of-state money in 2017, let's take as an example, the year after Trump was elected, there's a huge amount of national energy from groups all over the country that wanted to go wherever was next. And Virginia happened to be next. They wanted to send a message by sending money to Virginia. Uh, and there are a lot of bundling of small donations and things, but it ended up, you know, Act Blue is an example. Republicans always talk about how Act Blue, this PAC, has given a bazillion dollars. Well, Act Blue is just an aggregator. So you got to be careful how you do it um, and, and how you structure the rules. Uh, so Republicans are big for let's limit out of state contributions now because they see that's working to the advantage of Democrats. So whatever you do has to have some balance. A lot of the Democrats that have been elected are very much against corporate contributions and against lobbyist contributions. So can uh, you put those two things together? Can you put? You, you have to tie them together. That could be your that could be your trade off, right? Hey, yeah, you, yeah. Want, you want this? We'll give you a little bit of what everybody wants. We'll, we'll we'll cap the donations overall. So I think you could probably find the right cocktail, right? The right mix uh, of something for everybody, so there are the winners and losers kind of balance out. That's critical. And that's Vicky. That's what you were talking about. You were talking about negotiating with people in the legislature to get. Yeah, get language that a Republican like that still met what the Democrats were looking for. I mean, yeah, and, I, and it's like I said, it's not a it's just to Nancy, and that is, I know that American Promise is focused on the 28th Amendment, but I have a question as to whether or not this conversation and others that I've had suggest that combining the effort to roll back Citizens United with some other proposals about money and politics, either public funding or, or disclosure or limits on out-of-state money, that, that somehow it makes the package more attractive and more doable. Uh, obviously, you don't want to carry too much freight because you can't get it all done, but you're looking for openings. You're looking for buy-in. 
And that, I mean, that's, that's tough to do. How do you go about doing that, Nancy? Well, the, the, the question that I sent, I sent it to Marcus, actually, because the whole idea is we want to get this resolution passed, but everybody goes, well, this is a memorializing resolution. And it wasn't clear. Sam Razul had a bill a couple of years ago. It was the binding resolution linked to the, it's a Wolfpack bill linked to a constitutional convention. But, but he, he could never get, it got stuck in the rules committee. And then everybody was saying, well, it's a, res a memorializing resolution. And then it wasn't clear what happened this year. And I'm not even sure on the Senate side. So I don't even know if we could get a resolution passed. And, um, you know, I was I talking le less about the format than whether or not having a couple of other elements that have come up in this conversation public funding or limits on out-of-state money or limits on uh, things that are that are easier bites to take might attract people and become, as Mark was, was suggesting a couple of minutes ago, trade-offs, trading. Like a campaign uh, trading. finance reform bill where, where they're all in the same bill? Yeah, it depends upon what you need to do. No, maybe maybe they're not all in the same bill. I'm only I'm only talking about how you strike the political bargain. I'm not talking about how you write the. I mean, I think you're thinking ahead. I mean, how you write the the piece of legislation is is late in the game. It sounds to me as though you're still pretty early in the game in Virginia here on this issue of money and politics, because the state has no tradition of limiting money in politics. Yeah. So, real quick, let me ask you, Nancy. I, the, the old regime had a longstanding rule that we basically, they, they just summarily would dismiss any bill that was memorializing Congress to do anything, right? And, and it was just because uh, we wanted to keep our, we didn't want to try and nationalize um, state politics generally. We didn't want to spend a lot of time debating things that we didn't have a lot of control over, whether it was foreign affairs, foreign affairs in particular. I think it started out with foreign relations, we didn't want to get into, and it kind of said anything that had to do with a, was a purely quote unquote federal issue we wouldn't do. I think under the new regime, you may be able to get um, a crack in the dam for something that's memorializing Congress to do something that really does affect local and, and state issues. So I think that may be a distinguishing factor there. Sam's issue with the Article 5 convention, the problem with Article 5 is there's a big movement on the um, other side of the political spectrum to use Article 5 for a balanced budget amendment. And so whenever anybody sees Article 5, we, uh, you know, our sort of, the hair on our neck stands up because we're, we're ready for this big debate um, about what you know, the, the usefulness of Article 5 and, and, and it, it draws in a different crowd. Uh, so I think that's where some of that resistance has come from. So I think there, there may be an, an avenue to, to get some sort of a resolution um, that would express this view that as far as it's the position of the General Assembly, the corporations are not persons and don't have the right to contribute money and shouldn't be viewed that way. I think the other, the, and the incremental step is to go back to this public service corporation bill and revisit that issue. Uh, I think there is an appetite in the House to pass it. I think we didn't mess with it this year because there, we didn't want to divide our own caucus on a bill that had already died in the Senate. We didn't want to have that kind of vetting, you know, bloodletting, I should say, I guess is the word for it. Uh, over a bill that we had no no prospects in the other body, but I think that that's one that's worth revisiting as an incremental step towards corporations generally not having money. So let me just to your question. That's my view of it. Yeah, let me just ask you whether or not there's anything to be learned from the experience of Virginia one twenty twenty one on the whole gerrymander issue. I mean, they hung in for a very long time. You've got a very funny gerrymander reform uh, going forward to the voters this fall, in part because it was passed initially by a Republican dominated legislature and then seconded with some considerable reluctance by a Democratic led legislature. Um, but that was a grassroots movement that was pushing for gerrymander reform uh, for a number of years. I don't know. It seems to me quite a long time. And again, I'm back to this question. Is there something that a citizens movement can do uh, that either is focused solely on uh, rolling back Citizens United or tries to pick up a couple of these other bargaining chips uh, that would uh, that would win support? Or do you do what you're working on, Nancy, which is getting candidates to take the pledge, which says I will campaign on and I will vote for and I will stand with uh, the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, which will restore the power of Congress and the states to regulate. 
I mean, it, this is an important strategic question uh, for you all to think about. American promise nationally has picked the pledge as the way it wants to go. But if you're listening to somebody like Vicky, Vicky is in there and negotiating, trying to find some sponsors who will carry uh, the issue of campaign finance reform forward. So that's another way to go. So thank you very much. I'm just going to jump in here now, if I may. Um, and there are, there do seem to be many ways to the finish line. I keep thinking that the way to the finish line is legislation where you just have $6,000 limits and you go with that. Um, I'd also like to have the opportunity to let all the panelists take and look at the Q&A and see some of the things that have come up in the Q&A. Um, we have had David Abraham with a couple of questions and Chris, Chris Corfanta also with questions. And if you do have questions now, please put them into the Q&A. Thank you. Well, I wonder if I, David Abraham has a question here. Money doesn't uh, win elections. Money creates a relationship between money and the office holder. If you go look at national election statistics, um, winners in congressional races. Now, gerrymandered districts are the most important thing. Uh, often that, that settles it. But if you look at the competitive districts, the percentage of winners who have the predominance of money. Now, it has to be a significant predominance. If you're talking about uh, a candidate with $350,000 and somebody else with $275,000, that's probably uh, not, a, not a significant figure. But if you're talking about somebody who has two, three, four times as much money as the others, there's no question there's an overwhelming correlation between uh, the candidate that has more money and the candidate uh, and who wins. Um, so it, money does... Uh, in competitive election districts, a significant advantage in money is a significant political advantage. Um, and, and you can tell that the parties take this seriously because when they're considering which candidates the party regulars or the party committees want to endorse, they look at the ability of individual candidates to raise money is one of the things that will cause them either to back or not to back a candidate. So in the people who play the game for, for real, think money matters a lot, Mr. Abraham. And uh, I, I, would, I would be with them on that. It's not absolutely determinate, but it is a, over, a, an important advantage, a significant advantage. I don't know, I'm just trying to look at some of these questions. Anybody else can look at them if they want and come back. May I ask Marcus a bill uh, question? So Marcus, I think one of the critical issues is we're one of only four states that has no limitations on campaign finance. So do you think there's any possibility of getting, per, getting it through the House or the Senate? And if, if so, what, what do we need to do to, to do that? I think that's really the foundation of, of campaign finance, finance laws is, is limiting, limiting that spending. Yeah, so I think that there's probably an appetite for some size, what the right level is of campaign contribution. And then I think the other, so, so here's the issue we have in Virginia. We have no limit on the amount. We have no limit on who can contribute, essentially. And the third piece of this is, I think, the most corrosive. So you have no limit on what you can spend your money on. Right? We don't have any prohibition in Virginia on personal use of campaign funds. Um, and so um, yeah, part of the problem we've got is trying to figure out what's possible. So, so I have a bill that I put in every year uh, to limit the personal use of campaign funds. Uh, and the bill that we got almost across the finish line with Republicans, I didn't like once we took over, I didn't like it because I didn't think it went far enough. So I ditched that one and started over with a, a bill that had a lot more teeth and it was a lot more restrictive. And I found out maybe I'd gone too far for some of my Democratic friends as well. And so we're going to come back with that one next year with the right balance. But I, so I think there's, there is probably an appetite to, to, to limit what you can spend your money on and put in a, a prohibition on personal use of campaign funds. Uh, I think there will be probably, there's an appetite to come up with some sort of limit on contributions. And uh, I think again, uh, with the public service corporations, uh, I, you know, 
I think that going into an election year, um, it's worth revisiting all three of those things. I think that, that probably we can make some incremental progress. I don't think it's hopeless. I do think that uh, you know folks need to make clear that it's a, a, a big issue. The other issue we've got that makes 2021 very unpredictable is, um, and hard to frankly do grassroots campaigning in, is we don't know what our districts are gonna look like. Mm. Um, but to a certain extent, a lot of incumbents may lose some of their incumbent advantage in that we may be running in districts that are significantly different than the ones we have now. And you may have primaries between say somebody like me and somebody like Kay Corey that live close together, we might find ourselves in the same district. And so I think that to the extent that you can um, you know, make these big issues next year and say, hey, I may have a real choice between you and some other equally good person, and don't you wanna be on the right side of this issue? I think that creates a unique set of circumstances. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but I think it creates an opportunity for some grassroots activism to say, hey, listen, your base really cares about this issue and you may be in a precarious position. You don't know what your district's gonna look like. You may not be as safe and you may not be able to ignore us the way you may have in a district that you've represented consistently for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Hendrick, it's it's 8.10 now. Um, okay. Maybe um, we should thank the panel and maybe do a final poll. Well, I, I was just gonna say, uh, I think what you heard uh, are the complications that are built into any state and any any political system and what you what you've got to find as citizen activists as people who want to influence uh, the political process particularly to try to level the playing field uh, reduce the influence of mega money uh, whether it's the six thousand dollar donor or the ten thousand dollar donor uh, or you want to try to fix it with public funding of campaigns and by the way that has absolutely changed the landscape of, of the politics in connecticut it's absolutely amazing uh, and everybody assumes it's going to help the democrats actually the republicans have done well uh, women have done well minorities have done well in terms of all of them gaining representation since public funding went in in connecticut because connecticut was a state that had been dominated by democrats but i think what this is saying to you and what i'm hearing um nancy and this may be more interesting to you and those who are, want to lead this this fight is what are the elements that could swing to, to organize uh, an effective base what parts of the state does it make sense to campaign in? How do you rope in some of the conservatives that Vicki Barnes was talking about, getting this bipartisan uh, buy-in? Uh, and then what, what's the strategy that's gonna work? I mean, is, it, uh, is it just sticking with the 28th Amendment and, 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 and something as Marcus suggested, which is out of state? Or do you want to bring in some elements that, that have some home state appeal, like no outside money from, no donors from out of state, um, no foreign money, whatnot? I mean, I, th I think that it's a pregnant time you're talking about here, uh, and particularly, and you got some time because your legislative session is just over and your next one isn't uh, for a while to come. Anyway, but I, I found the, uh, I thought the discussion was interesting. I, I, I thought what Marcus and Vicky had to offer uh, was terrific, and I thought your background was good. And I do think the example of other states is important. I mean, it is utterly amazing what happened in 2018 in this country. I mean, there were five states that adopted gerrymander reform. Uh, you know, there were three or four states that uh, that went for public funding. Major cities went for public funding of campaigns like Phoenix and Denver uh, and Baltimore uh, and Portland, Oregon. Uh, there were seven or eight states that expanded automatic voting registration and, and uh, same-day voter registration. Of course, your legislature did it all in one fell swoop in January, February, and March. I mean, it was amazing what you did. But the point is, citizen power is, is on the move in this country. It is effective. Um, and, and the question is, how do you organize it? And how do you frame um, proposals? that will attract people uh, of different political stripes. But now my question is, and I hope your question is, what's been the impact? Uh, has, our, has our discussion been valuable to people at all? Maybe you want to run that poll again. Isn't that what you're going to do, Nancy? Yeah, why don't we do that, Stair? 
just ask people that as they leave how they feel compared to how when they walked in. Stare. Have we lost her? Yeah, no, you're, I, I'm here. I'm here and I'm going to put up. You ready to roll? I'm, I, I'm working it. Well, I, I want to thank Sorry. you all for, for holding this and thank certainly Vicki and Mark. Hold on for me to like get this poll up, okay? Yeah. So we've got our final poll here. Okay. And it's not cooperating the way I thought it would. Technology, uh, technology is always the first hitch, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, the ones to just get back. Oh, here we go. I got it. I got it. I, whoops. All right, so give me a second. I found the drop down menu. And it, of course, took me over to someplace else. So here we go. Poll two. Here we go. Launch poll. Here we go. How's that look? It's up there. Okay. It should look, it should Final, look the same. The question is do you feel any differently? Final okay. pulse in progress. I can't vote. Oh, I'm sorry. I just like rushed it again because that's one of those things that I have a little bit of control over. Right. So you can vote. You don't need to vote. I mean, it's always nice to see you. So we have this final pulse in progress. It's been up for 30 seconds now. Are people seeing this? If you're not seeing this, no, people are seeing this. Okay, so we're starting to get some, some answers. Thank you. I'll just wait a little bit longer while I see that nobody okay so that's a minute thank you so much we're going to end the poll and then i'm going to share the results so here are the results 86. and we may have less people what do you think Yes, 20% yes, no. I think the last question is the most important one. Number four, do you feel yeah. empowered, motivated? Because 95% of the people have said they do. So I, I think that that's a good sign. I think that, um, you know, I really want to thank Hedrick uh, for helping with us. He's been such a big supporter all over the country and we're talking with other legislators and candidates about doing these in, in other cities. I'm hoping, you know, perhaps we could do it in Charlottesville. And Vicki, of course, I always appreciate your support. And Marcus, thanks so much. I think you've been an ins inspiration to all of us. Um, we really, you know, the fact that you were the vice chair of the, of the Privileges and Election Committee, I mean, we were disappointed that things didn't get through, um, certainly the Senate, but, you know, maybe with less, uh, pressure in terms of bills we can, and if you can give us advice on how, both on the resolution and, and some of these, um, these campaign finance bills, how we can get them through, that would be. Uh, absolutely, I'll be happy to. I look forward to, to the opportunity to work with you all uh, in the coming session. Okay, thanks everybody. It's uh, eight, almost 8.20, so thanks for your time, and we'll be getting back to you. Thanks, thanks for the Women's Summit for hosting this. This is just, uh, Thanks, Stair. This has really been very informational. And, 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 so and one last thought, looking at the questions and looking at the chat comments, please be sure to go back through it. There's some very interesting ideas and thoughts to pick up on. We tried to cover them indirectly as much as we could, but we certainly didn't cover them all. I want to thank people for their input. Okay, bye everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Stair. Uh, th Thanks, thank you all. Thank you all for this evening. And, and Stair, for, you, you recorded it, right? Yes, it's all been recorded. And sure the, the, the chats and the question and Q&As have also been recorded. So if there's more that people want to learn and um, add to, it will be up on YouTube for everyone who's registered for the Women's Summit. Okay. Wonderful.
Thanks Thank so you. much. Bye, Vicky. Bye, Hedrick. Bye, Hedrick. Bye, Bye. Bye. everybody. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.